Hi, welcome to this uh, webinar, Women, Water and Urban Life. My name is Nahuel Becan, and today I will have the role of coordinating this webinar. My office and my team have carried out uh, several projects related to water in different parts of the world. More and more, we have been adding experiences that help us to create a stronger and more sustainable designs. Among other things, and what today brings us together, is our interest in making visible the relationship between women, water, and urban life. Many times, this relationship, however essential, has been neglected or kept hidden. We would like to bring forth these bonds in our designs and in our work. We believe this could be the start of a new paradigm of, for the design of space. Moreover, we would like to give attention, credit, and respect to women all over the world who pay great efforts to have access to water to them and their families. For this webinar, we have two speakers today who will share their research and experiences on this subject. Each speaker will be present for 15 minutes, and after them, we will have a slot of 15 minutes for questions to them. For this, I would like to Araceli Rojas to lead the discussion and moderate participations. To make it easier, please, put your question on the chat panel, and Araceli will gather them and transmit them to our speakers. So, I am pleased to introduce Valeria Leiva and Ishita Bedamutu. Valeria Leiva is an architect and climate change and sustainable specialist. Her interest in social development led her to participate in different projects with NGOs in Mexico, India, and in the Netherlands. Ishita Bedamutu is a feminist, system thinker, and intersectional environmentalist. Ishita formulates a gynocentric, woman-focused, social vulnerability framework for extreme climate events in the context of Kanagi Nagar in Chennai, India. Thank you, uh, first of all, for being here. Uh, there are now uh, 42 participants. Um, I will start now with the presentations. I give the floor to Valeria. Please, Valeria, start with your presentation. Thank you, Noel. I'm going to share my screen. It takes one second. Okay. Screen sharing. I believe I'm going to Okay, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Valeria Leiva, and I'm going to present the research I conducted about the impact of water scarcity in women's life in Iztapalapa, Mexico City. Water is a source of life and a natural resource that supports the environment. However, it can also be the origin of risk and vulnerability. Climate change has been in the world's agenda for a very long time, but during the last years, because of the rapid population growth and urban concentration, the impact of this phenomenon has affected the water supply and the demand side. And it has also proved the inefficiency of the government to meet the city's growing needs. According to the WHO and UNICEF, the poor and the marginalized groups are the ones with lacking access. However, women are dispropor disproportionately affected by the water crisis. The UNDP Human Development Report said that globally millions of women and young girls are forced to spend hours collecting and carrying water. This restricts their opportunities and their choices. This crisis hold back poverty reduction in the world's poorest countries. One of the most relevant example, and which has caused uh, a lot of controversy, is the case of the Iztapalapa delegation in Mexico City. 
So to put all of us in context, Mexico City is an agglomeration of neighborhoods which are actually large cities. According to the INEGI data from 2015, Iztapalapa has 2 million inhabitants in 117 square kilometers. So it's as big as Vienna or Hamburg. Iztapalapa also has the highest population density in the whole country. It also has a lot of socioeconomic challenges and is one of the most dangerous neighborhoods in Mexico City. It also lacks of infrastructure and urban services, especially in the distribution of drinking water. The soci social segregations reflect the inequality in the distribution of drinking water between the richest and poorest delegations of Mexico City. Inefficient, unsustainable, and inequitable. This is how the World Bank describes the water infrastructure in Mexico City. For decades, the people there survive with permanent rationing, since sometimes they can spend several weeks without receiving a drop of water in the supply networks. Access to water is highly related to social inequality in Mexico City. If we compare the water consumption between the marginalized and richest areas in Mexico City, we can see that in the first ones, the consumption is 28 liters per day per capita, while in the richest areas, it goes between 800 to 1,000 liters per day per capita. So everything that has to do with water in this city is related to inequality. But for women, the water crisis is personal. The main question of my research was to know how does the inequality in the distribution of drinking water affect the quality of life of women in Iztapalapa, Mexico City? Unfortunately, the so social inequality begins at home. Big Mexico, a country with strong traditions, the role of women has slowly started to change. But in the most marginalized and poor areas, as is the case of Iztapalapa, it remains the same. And their position in the society is being housewife most of their time. While men can go out and perform other activities, women are forced to stay at home, depending on the main income. One of the activities they need to do every day is to collect water, and they can spend several hours every day by doing this task. The United Nations Department said that women's lives all around the world are closely connected to water. During my research, I conducted a survey with 30 respondents, and to be able to make a profile of the respondents, I asked two questions. The first one was their occupation, and the second one, their level of education. 86% of the respondents says, said that they were completely dedicated of the domestic work, which was obviously reflected in the level of education they had access, because only 10% of them had a chance to finish a bachelor's degree. Social inequality is also reflected in the access to water. Uh, I asked three questions. The first one is to know if, I wanted to know if they had access to drinking water in their home. And 57% said that they had access. And then I wanted to know if the service was constant. And they, they said yes, 47% said yes, that the service was constant. And I wanted to know then how many days per week they received water. And it was very surprising that only 46% said that they received water one or two days per week. So they have lived a big part of their life with this basic, with the lack of this basic service. So they no longer perceive it as an efficiency. It became a way of life to only receive water one or two days and still think they have a constant service. So if there is no or not enough water coming out of the pipelines, how do they get value for the daily use? And I received three answers. The first one is that they buy water bottles. They use this water for cooking and for personal hygiene. Because uh, the water that is coming out from the pipelines, it's, it has a very bad quality and they have already experienced health problems and skin issues. 
This also taking into account that represents an extra expense for every household. They also capture rainwater when it's possible, which they mainly use for the housework. But the main source of water are the water trucks, which is a service provided by the federal government. The water trucks are an operating system with the purpose to fill the water tanks of the neighborhood. They only need to make a call, give their name and the address, and they are, they are supposed to receive this service. However, during my research, uh, all the women said that it's not as simple as it seems, because if they want to receive the water, they need to deal directly with the drivers and they always ask for a fee to deliver the water as soon as possible. They also mention that the service is unreliable, unregulated, and not constant, and obviously is dangerous for women. So I wanted to know the life conditions of the women living in Iztapalapa, and how do they deal with the problem of not having access to drinking water. And this is only one of the statements I collected but most of them were very similar. I wake up at 5.30 a.m., prepare everything and take my kids to school. When I come back, I verify how much water is left. In case there is still some, I prioritize activities. For personal hygiene and cooking, we always buy water bottles. The other scenario is that when there is no water left, I call the water truck. Receiving this service could take from three days till two weeks. I need to stay at home waiting for the service. If we do not receive water in time, I walk long distances trying to find a water truck. If I find one, I need to pay an extra fee and try to convince the driver to deliver water to my home. Many times, the drivers have asked me to ride with them until we get there. This situation is very scary and uncomfortable, but I do not have another option. They also mention that they need to stay at home the whole day because if the water pipe uh, truck arrives and there is nobody there to receive it, the service is immediately canceled and they need to start the process all over again. They also said that they prefer to be in charge of this activity rather, rather than their daughters because it can be very dangerous for them. Other coping strategies that they also mention is that they prefer to buy fast food. This in order to not use water for cooking and they can save it and use it for another purpose. They also use disposable plates in order also to not wash the dishes. The combination of these two strategies is causing them, it starts causing them uh, health problems. It generates a huge amount of garbage and it also adds one more extra expense to every household. However, women have built resilience against this crisis, and they have been able to organize themselves, and the sense of community is very important for them. For example, they take morning and night watch turns to wait for the water truck. Others go and make long lines to ask for the service while some others carry water for friends and family. These are three different activities, but they have, all, they have one thing in common, and it's that they all are willing to do whatever it takes to have water. So how is their quality of life affected? Since the moment the little girls are forced to drop out of school to help their mothers with housework, it becomes clear what is going to happen next. The lack of skills and knowledge <clears throat> that they would normally get during, during their education are not there. So getting a job in the labor market is more complicated and that prevents them from being independent. The consumption of fast food and the bad quality of water starts causing them health problems. And they are exposed to dangerous situations when trying to get water, such, such as fights, robbery, and rapes. So living with fear all the time becomes normal. In conclusion, 
we can say that from the moment in which women have a established role in the society that keeps them only in the, in the world of domestic work and deprives their rights and freedom, such as the right to education, it becomes clear what type of life they will have ahead. It's a reality that the lack of water affects their life by the simple fact of not having access to this basic service but everything becomes more complicated when they are the only ones responsible for collecting it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Valeria, okay. for the very good introduction. Cut any call. I would like to say to the people in the room, please turn the phone off. Because we have a lot of, of uh, time, please turn the microphone off. And uh, you can write questions in the chat. Uh, it's a very, very nice, <laughs> very nice. <laughs> please turn the microphone on. Okay, thanks. Um, thank you very much again, Valeria, and please, I, uh, I will give the, the floor to uh, Ishita. Please, Ishita, share your presentation with us. Yes, thank you, Nahuel. I request uh, whoever's microphone is on to please turn it off. There's a lot of disturbance. Yes, thank you. Um, uh, to start with, first, I'd like to thank uh, Nahuel and Valeria for giving me this opportunity to present my research. And so in a nutshell, for my master's thesis, I formulated a gynocentric vulnerability disaster risk framework for urban resettled populations and resettlement sites. Many words I know, some familiar and some probably alien to you, but the plan is to break it down quite literally word by word. To begin with, what is gynocentric and more importantly, why gynocentric? Any city is a representation or a manifestation of our lives as urban citizens, of our communities and how we organize ourselves. It is also a representation of our values as a society. Most modern cities of today in both developed and developing countries have been planned and designed by men and for men. The traditional roles of men and women have dictated these norms throughout uh, history. However, the 21st century urban woman does not abide by these traditional roles anymore in excluding her perspective and not considering her roles and needs while planning any part of the city means preventing her from having the same access and benefits to the city as a man. As far back as 1990, the IPCC predicted that the single greatest impact of climate change will be on human migration. The World Migration Report estimated that in 2018 alone, 2.9 million people were displaced by tropical storms and floods alone. In the last two years, India has been hit by at least one major weather event every month. And UN figures estimate that 80% of people who are displaced and are most vulnerable to the impacts of climate change are women. Chennai or Madras, as it was once known, is one of the top 15 cities in the world at risk from climate change. The city has experienced an earthquake followed by the Indian Ocean tsunami in 2004. In 2015, there was the infamous Chennai flood. What was initially passed off by the state government as a consequence of climate change in the form of unprecedented rainfall due to the El Nino event, which also led to Cyclone Varda the following year. However, in 2018, the Comptroller and Auditor General of India categorized the flooding as a man-made disaster due to management at almost mismanagement sorry, at almost all levels and held the government responsible for the devastation across the state of Tamil Nadu. 
In contrast to the abundance of water that Chennai received in 2015 and 2016, the yearly monsoon failed in the years to come, leading to day zero. On June 19, 2019, it was officially announced that the reservoirs that supplied water to more than 7 million people had run dry. The city of Chennai has two rivers running through it, the Kuam River in the north and the Adya River in the south, with the Buckingham Canal that cuts across it perpendicular to uh, the rivers and parallel to the shoreline. The banks of these rivers were home to the city slums or the urban poor. Due to two development projects, the restoration of riverfronts and the construction of an elevated expressway, the people living along the rivers had been forcefully ev evicted and resettled in the periphery of the city since the early 2000s. They have been displacing these people, most of them who are now considered essential workers, in resettlement sites that are unfit for construction and are generally marshlands and flood prone areas. There was a surge in these resettlement drives, especially after the tsunami and the floods. One of these resettlement sites, which is over 20 years old, is Kanagi Nagar, which made, a great, which made for a great case study in this context. The case of Kanagi Nagar is not unique to Chennai or to India. The colony shares physical, economic, and social characteristics with other resettlement colonies across the global south. Therefore, studying this case made the framework generalizable to comparable sites in countries where the complexities of development politics run deep. Kanagi Nagar is located 1 to 1.5 kilometers off the Rajiv Gandhi IT Expressway in the south of Chennai. However, 20 years ago, the city's limits had not expanded as far as Kanagi Nagar. Initial resettlers complained that they had no roads, no water, no connection to their old lives and jobs. I was told by a few women that they protested and fought with the authorities till they gave them roads and a bus stand, primary health care centers and schools. It was quite obvious from the width of the roads leading to Kanagi Nagar that they had not been planned for bus traffic, making certain blind corners accident prone. Many initial resettlers had either sold or rented out their tenements and simply moved back to the slums in the city simply because they could not restore their livelihoods in Kanagina. Last year, I surveyed 150 women who currently reside in Kanaginaga for varied lengths of time. 70% had been resettled, out of which only 58% owned the houses that they were residing in. The rest had moved to Kanagi Nagar for its relatively lower cost of living. The registration of tenements in Kanagi Nagar is only given in the name of the woman of the house, unless they sold the property or leave it to their sons. Despite having ownership, it was interesting to note that 60% said that their husbands or fathers-in-law were the heads of the households. 86% of the respondents were married. Most were uneducated or had only completed primary education. More than half the respondents were employed in the informal sector, none of whom who had savings or an adequate income for their expenses. It was these women that became the basis for the gynocentric framework. Which brings me to my research question. What are the factors that explain the varying levels of social vulnerability displayed by these women in these urban resettlement sites to extreme disaster events? Using the case of Kanagi Nagar, I adapted Michael Sonia's risks and reconstruction framework for rural migrants to, cert, to suit the urban nature of the case and established four outcomes of urban resettlement, employment, health, location, and the built environment. I hypothesized that these outcomes exacerbated the exposure to disaster events, making them and their livelihoods sensitive to them. My research took the view that vulnerability, or more specifically, social vulnerability, is a state within a system. Therefore, I used indicators that are properties of the system and measured by their current conditions, and not just the conditions that enable impact, but also prevent the impact of disaster. And therefore, social vulnerability served as a function of their exposure, sensitivity, as well as their adaptive capacity as recommended by the IPCC and the Sustainable Livelihoods Framework. However, the case in question is the women. So how do they feature in this framework? 
The general population of Kanaginaga is both at risk from the outcomes of resettlement as well as extreme water events. That is why it becomes necessary to distinguish the characteristics that make these women inherently vulnerable to these disasters, like their age, level of education and general awareness, their caste and religion, their civil status, ownership, family structure, household size, as well as their roles and responsibilities at home. These variables and their relationships with each other became the basis for the gynocentric social vulnerability disaster risk framework for urban resettled populations and resettlement sites. So on applying the framework to the case of Kanagi Nagar, I found that the built environment and the employment outcomes of resettlement had the most impact on their vulnerability to drought and not to flooding. Since I collected all the data during the peak of drought in Chennai last year, these relationships between the variables are significant in the case of drought and not flooding, most probably because of the recency effect, which is a cognitive bias in respondents that favors more recent events over ones that have occurred in the past. Understandable too, given that at that point, they had not seen rain for almost three years. What made these women more or less vulnerable was actually their civil status, which gave them additional responsibilities that made it difficult for them to generate incomes or adapt their built environment to suit their needs. And much like in Mexico, they were getting water only once a week to once in 10 days and every street around 15 to 20 houses sometimes shared a water pump with a, that the Chennai Metro water trucks filled. And this is not drinkable water, they had to buy drinking water separately and I was told that the prices of drinking water had increased by rupees five that year. And this was a trend for them, especially during the summer months. This water shortage in turn disrupted their, daily, <coughs> disrupted their daily life. And like Valeria mentioned, they had to prioritize their activities around this irregular, unpredictable water supply. On the other hand, when it came to flooding, a lot of women did not see themselves at risk because like I mentioned earlier, they had not seen rains. Their current problems outweighed the past challenges that came with an abundance of water. However, the data told a slightly different story. 80% of the ground floor houses had had to leave their houses and sometimes even leave Kandagi Nagar in 2015. The data also showed that when, where the street would not get flooded, the ground floor houses did. And this was because post flood, the roads were raised, bringing them to the same level as the houses. This caused a level difference in the road and the area surrounding the houses, causing stagnation around the house, even with a little rain. And if there is excess rain, the toilets in the ground floor houses start flooding. The fact that these people lived hand to mouth most of the time meant that they had no savings to make structural changes to their houses to adapt to flooding. All in all, making it a breeding ground for mosquitoes and the diseases that came with unsanitary conditions that they pointed out to me. 80% of the women did not know how to swim unless they had been resettled from the fisher colonies that were displaced post tsunami. Most older women were not confident of being able to save themselves in the case of another major flooding event. And all these vulnerabilities that I mentioned are rooted in the outcomes of resettlement. The two most significant factors that con contributed to their vulnerability to these disasters were the built environment and the employment outcomes of resettlement. Most of the women were unsatisfied with the quality of tenements, <clears throat> the provision of water. They complained about the provision of adequate sewers, about the lack of hygiene, and almost all the women complained of inadequate incomes for their expenses, with 99% saying that they had no savings in case of an emergency. Although it has been 20 years since they were resettled, most women find it hard to find, con to find convenient formal job. So clearly location and health outcomes played a role indirectly too. The variable civil status, or rather the socioeconomic freedom they had and the effect of their household duties and responsibilities on their employment and social life was found to be the only significant mediating variable in this relationship meaning that their civil status played a significant role in their vulnerability and most women were neutral about their socioeconomic freedom and the role in decision making of their household but they were extremely vocal about the responsibilities that came with being the woman of the house 
for me it has been very difficult i work in two houses in tiruvannur which is approximately 10 kilometers away the time i take to travel i could be spending time with my kids or doing housework said one respondent apart from that working far away from kannagina government that they had to miss the arrival of the water truck and would have to depend on other family members or friends also a lot of their income goes into either traveling to their place of work by bus or share autos it was their household responsibilities in a poorly serviced site the lack of networks and their responsibilities of child care combined with distance timing and transport that compelled many women to leave their jobs the implication of this finding is that rather than spousal restrictions, it was their predefined role in society as a homemaker and the responsibilities that come with it that make them intrinsically vulnerable. So to whom and why is such a study relevant? First, it helps in identifying vulnerable groups of women and helps in prioritization of rescue and relief in the event of another flooding or drought crisis. Widows, resettlers, who are also still renters, illiterate women with low general awareness were significantly more vulnerable in the case of Kanaginagar. Second, it points out the gaps in the entire resettlement process right from eviction to the planning and design of these resettlement sites. From being the vulnerable poor who occupied the voids of the city, creating slums around their centers of employment in order to make better lives for themselves, they are then forcefully evicted without warning, thrown outside the city to the periphery, only for them to lose their livelihood, their social network, and their own lives to become more vulnerable as they once were. Through lengthy discussions with women in Kanaginagar, I was told that more than anything, their biggest problem is the stigma associated with their colony. They are, they are denied jobs and loans simply because they are from Kanaginagar. So it then becomes apparent that these resettlers are caught in multiple positive feedback loops. The built environment and the formal job market reinforce traditional roles of men, of men and women and making, them more, making these women more vulnerable to the impacts of extreme water events. This, the site's propensity to flooding water stagnation and unsanitary conditions have been exacerbated by raising the main roads and neglecting smaller lanes and not paying heed to the plinth level of the tenements. The scarcity of water also meant unsanitary conditions due to improper cleaning and most respondents found that the provision of water and sewer infrastructure was inconsistent. The formal job market does not accommodate the unpredictable lives of these women, and so they have to depend on the informal market or become small-scale entrepreneurs or remain unemployed, as the case is with most of them. At the same time, these women have years of experience living in undesirable conditions, and the strong bonds that they have with each other, as well as the expansion of the city's limits that brings economic opportunity closer to the community has contributed to their survival up until this day. If given the know-how and the guidance that is uh, taking advantage of their adaptive capacity, I'm sure these women would display tremendous capacity to adapt and achieve desirable resilience. Which brings me to this story that came in the Hindu early last month, it was about five it was about five women from Panaginagar who soon after the COVID-19 outbreak took police permission and cordoned off their street after ensuring that the stretch was clean and everyone wore their masks. The article reads, and I quote, thanks to women like them, Kanaginagar has transformed from a locality where until a month ago people roamed around without a mask, unmindful of the virus, to an area where 95% of the residents have started following safety measures. So with their limited resources and more impact, more importantly, their proactiveness, these five women made a difference to an unimaginable number of people living in the area. And thank you. Ishita, thank you very much for your presentation. It was really, really, really interesting to hear you, to see and Kanaga and I about uh, the women and the role of the women in relation with the water. And I would like to ask to um, Araceli, please, to start with the questions, to, to, to manage the question, please. Yes. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. Well, 
Very interesting, both uh, presentations. Thank you. Thank you on behalf of the participants. Well, I will start with uh, one question to, to Valeria. Well, these are twofold questions. So uh, mm -hmm. somebody is asking, um, when exactly was your study conducted? And mm -hmm. if uh, you have any idea of how the current pandemic is uh, affecting women currently. Okay. Um, I conducted my research in June 2018, so almost already two years ago. And right now, with the situation of, of the coronavirus, I was also reading the, the news to see how the situation was there. And right now, there are almost 9,000 confirmed cases only in Zapalapa. And it was also very surprising that a lot of newspapers were saying that Iztapalapa has more cases than 118 countries, like Cuba, Hungary, or Costa Rica. And it's only like a delegation of Mexico City. So for me, that was like very, very impressive. And on, uh, the quarantine was never happening there because uh, women and everybody needed to go out to continue with their daily life because they needed the money and they needed still to get water. So quarantine was not happening. And the situation with the water didn't improve at all. So yeah, that is my, my answer for that question. Okay, I have a, a question for Ishita. Somebody asked here that if uh, during your study, was there any aspect of uh, water, manage water management uh, happening regarding uh, disasters? I mean, during your study? Mm, in the sense, like you're talking about top-down planning or management or? I guess uh, here um, somebody is referring that you were talking about droughts and uh, flooding, no? Uh -huh. So in particular with these two type of disasters, I mean, was any of these two happening while you were doing your research? Um, so as far as drought was concerned, uh, well, China was going through the drought uh, while we were, but since then, uh, actually, there were 20,000 women in some part of Tamil Nadu, I'm not sure where, but they actually restored an entire river and they brought back the entire ecosystem. So yeah, there have been a lot of uh, uh, drought uh, things post the drought. But uh, yeah, and as far as flooding goes, like my research pointed out that it's these sort of adaptive measures that, that they're taking, like they, try to raise the roads because they found the roads for flooding. So they raised the roads and what happened was the uh, the ground around these houses, they weren't raised. So all the water went into the houses. So it they created more of a problem rather than s solving the problem. And that's what happens, I guess, when it, in India. Yeah. So uh, currently is more the drought problem um, and and a when, when the, in, the um, monsoon, in the monsoon they're expecting more rain and well in the summer months it's a drought because of mismanagement of water yeah and you mentioned that only with a little rain i mean mm -hmm. these floods even can happen right yeah but there is always water stagnation so mm. even in like good areas of and not so poor areas there's always water stagnation so yes okay Okay, I have a uh, here. I will turn to Valeria. Um, there is here one one other question. Uh, was there any improvement in access to water when you compare women education levels? Um, yeah, somehow because when women have the opportunity to yeah to have access to education that also led them to get a job. And of course, the, there's the economy improved. So they were also able to move somewhere else where they, where they had like the possibility to have access to water in their homes. And also, um, yeah, maybe also other, other members of their families were, were, of their family were helping them. 
So they were going out, they were working, they were having uh, other, um, other activities. And uh, yeah, they, they didn't need to keep thinking about the water because the water was there. So in the moment they had the chance to have education that led them to, a need to have a job. And also the quality of life increased because they moved to, an, to a house or to an area that didn't have those problems. Yes, yes. So yeah, that, 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 uh, that reflects how even uh, the opportunity to women to, to, to have a, yeah, to go to the school, it's, it's, it's in, uh, in, in that point, the quality of life starts uh, increasing. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then when they try to, well, they grow up and then they try to get a job, it's, it happens almost the same, right? And so they don't have yeah. even access to, to a good job opportunity, right? Yes, exactly. And that uh, allows them to not stay in a house where they don't have water. Mm -hmm. So they have the income and the means to search for better opportunities, not only, not only for them, but also for their families. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. okay. Well, I have a, a question for both of you, but then let's start with, the, with Ishita. Um, so in, in both presentations, we saw that, uh, that there were some sort of bad urban planning no? or bad uh, space planning in, in order for, I mean, not only women, but families to get access to, to clean water. So what, do you, what would you say in regards to urban planning to, to find uh, solutions to this uh, shortage or this bad conditions in regards to water that in these two cases it is in fact that women are 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 taking over to to solve them so what would be um your idea ishita in regards to urban planning to, in order to solve yeah. these situations well uh well actually from our previous conversation earlier as now well pointed out the street is a very important uh place where they collect water, where they have their social interactions. So I would say first, pay attention to the street and, and also the voids. Usually architects, urban planners, they tend to look at what they're putting in terms of solid structures, but look at what happens in the voids of the city as well. And I guess also pushing these people out to the periphery is not the answer because they like especially now with covid they are the essential workers you know they clean the city. they make sure the city is clean and things like that so by pushing them out is not the answer you need i guess and also make it more of a participatory process you know because they will tell you what they need they know what they need in terms of provisions and in, in terms of like you know uh, uh, water infrastructure because I mean, like, yeah, so I guess a more participatory process right from eviction, for especially for resettlers, I think would be a most, uh, more sustainable solution rather than just forcefully evicting them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What would you say, Valeria? Oh, Valeria freezed. <laughs> She's stuck. She freezed with that question. <laughs> well, um, Maybe if there's another question for me. To well, <laughs> maybe I, I wanted. Um, Valeria, are you there? Okay. Yes, I'm sorry. Yeah, you freeze out. No. Do you want to intervene with that? Uh, with that I question? I can hear you. Ah, uh, yeah. Your connection is is. It's not good. We cannot hear you. It's not Now, can you hear me now? Now, yes. Now, yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay, so it was the same question as Ishita, right? Yes, yes, yes. Okay, yeah, I, uh, I totally agree with her. It's very important to start involving women in the decisions and in the planning because they are living there, they have lived like that their whole life, and I mean, who knows better than them what, it, what, what do they need and what is needed to, to, to do there. So it's very important to start taking them into account in every decision and also to uh, also start paying attention in, in, in the design of the streets because all the exchange is happening there. So if they are forced to go out uh, of their homes, let's make it safer for them. So I don't know. We, 
providing like very uh, big public spaces or with lighting and things like that. Mm -hmm. But it's very important for me to start involving them and also to start involving men in this activity. So they they no longer need to be the only ones in charge of this activity and they, and they can also have access to other opportunities. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you have any uh, other insight, uh, Ishita? I saw you nodding with, <laughs> with regards on the on the streets. Yeah. Huh? Uh, no, I was just agreeing with that. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I I saw in both oh. presentations. I think it was just uh, randomly that you both chose this uh, line of women with buckets. Yeah. No, I mean it. It is actually the same image, but in different parts of the world with, exactly. with different. I mean, clothes mm -hmm. and different buckets, actually, <laughs> but uh, very colorful in, in that sense. And, and I agree, something is happening on the street level. And I think that if urban planners can intervene on the, on the how the space is organized, because much of what is happening socially as well is happening on the, on the streets. But what Ishita showed very clearly is that uh, the streets are being flooded, no, mm -hmm. because they are are badly planned so if maybe if even something slightly like fixing the the street will will maybe be start of the solution right mm -hmm. okay i won't do my comments okay so another question um so the, somebody here is, is saying no so day zero is approaching very fast for many cities so so what would you say that well i mean the, this day zero catastrophes are coming to us and also for for example the pandemic covid is part of of what it is approaching already to us i mean we perhaps we are already in day zero so what would you say that um what how to manage this uh, current situation that we are facing right now and it, it is splashing onto our faces so what would be uh our job or, or our task in order to start solving, not maybe uh, solving, but also impeding this real massive catastrophe all over the world. Ishita? Well, um, in the case of, well, these women, in case of any women, actually, if you, I think if you give them empowerment enough, if you give them the knowledge and the know-how, you know, they will do something about it. It's, it's mostly because of ignorance that people don't know that they're wasting water, you know, for example. So I guess if you let them know and you say, okay, these are solutions, you know, rain, like harvest your rainwater, but that's the most simple solution to like, if you are getting a lot of rainwater, and I think there was this one guy who said abundance is never a problem till it's mismanaged. And that's exactly what is happening. Like there's too much water and it's not being managed well. And so when there's drought, there's no water and that makes no sense. Right. Yeah. So I guess it's just giving them that know-how is important. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Valeria. Yeah. I mean, for example, in the case of Mexico City, um, of course there are people that waste water, but I think that at least in Tapalapa they have a very um, like the sense that they need to save it because they don't know when they are going to get more. Mm -hmm. So for me, it's also, I mean, everything, as I already said, was reduced to inequality. Because you go to the rich areas and they don't have these problems. They don't even think about this. So it's important also to start creating the awareness, not only in Iztapalapa, but also in, in, the, in the other areas that, you know, you don't have to face this problem every day. Exactly. But this, like your neighbor is facing these problems every day. So also like bring those communities to, not all, I mean, bring the communities together to also start solving the problem. Mm -hmm. And also um, what I discovered during my research was that the government somehow, I mean, inside them, they know that there is a lack of water, but they don't see it and they don't, care basically so also i don't know maybe if more people start like putting pressure there maybe they will react and mm -hmm. and, and measures are going to start uh, going to start taking place 
but I think it's a combination of of the society in general mm -hmm. of, of many actors and many stakeholders working mm -hmm. together in relation to politics there is some uh, one question for Ishita mm -hmm. here so they are asking how was the relationship of community with local political group in terms of support to Kanaginaga mm -hmm. and you did say that uh, women sought support of the police to secure their area. So could you elaborate on that? Yeah, so the TNSCB or the Tamil Nadu Slum Clearance Board is actually in charge of Kanaginagar. And they do have a local councillor who these people look up to as God because they, he has provided them with schools, he has provided them with uh, PHCs, with roads, with a bus stand, which they did not have. So actually these people have a great uh, rapport with him. But then again, as any community, those who are within his favor are able to get, you know, infrastructure or anything. But those who are not, there's again inequality there. So there are parts of Kanaginaga which are actually very uh, dangerous or so they say because even these local uh, leaders are not able to penetrate through. So it's a little complicated. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um... Let me see if I can get a, a last question because we are running out of time. Um, so a, a very specific question for, for Valeria. So what role do the w water bottle companies, I mean, because there are also these big factor of these uh, maybe Coca-Cola or these big companies mm -hmm. you know, that sell mm -hmm. the bottled water and you mentioned that in your in your presentation because women depend on those bottled waters to cook. So do they have a role in, in the delivery of water or do they have a role in the conflict you described to us? Uh, not really. Yeah, not really. I mean, they deliver the water. Well, they are like the little shops in every, in every street and they just go there, they leave the water and then they leave. It's like not their business. Okay. So, um, yeah, they, I, I, I don't know if, I mean, I'm sure they are aware of, of what is happening inside that delegation. But as I already said, if that problem is not affecting them, they don't care. They just go there, they do their job and that's it. And... I was reading, I don't know, I was last week or something like that, that Mexico is uh, is one of the countries that uh, buys more water bottle. So um, I think that also says says a lot mm -hmm. about the, the, yeah, the importance of this problem and how is, yeah, how people need, need to deal with this. And the fact that they need to buy this water is it's also it also represents a huge impact for them because it's also very very expensive the water yes yes so um, yeah I, I don't think they play like a, a central role in this in this crisis yes okay uh i think uh, one last question for ishita uh before we uh, wrap it up so ishita would you say crowded or societally poorer areas like Kanagi Nagar are also more susceptible to disease due to the excessive drought and flooding or common use of unmaintained pipelines? Yes, yes, I do think they are more vulnerable to disease and also because of density, they're not able to socially distance themselves. So like in terms of COVID also, they are very prone and they have to be very proactive, I think, at this point to prevent disease. Yeah, how they are managing with COVID. I mean, as as you described. Well, was... like I mentioned, a lot of the essential workers of Chennai come from Kanaginagar as well. So there are cases of COVID that COVID is rampant in Chennai right now. Mm. So, uh, yes, so there are cases, but then they're also like, thanks to those five women, like I mentioned, you know, they are be, they are aware of the precautions that they need to take. Mm -hmm, so, mm -hmm. yeah. So well, we can only be hopeful, I guess. Yes, yes. I will wrap it up uh, here, um, Valeria and Ishita. Uh, there are more questions that are left uh, unanswered, but we will gather them and then we will pass them to 
personally to their your email so those who i mean your answer was not answered during the webinar we will collect it and um, we will pass it on to to your personal emails and just to wrap it up, I mean, for this discussion that was very interesting, I think there is a very conflictive and there are many parts of the prob of this situation, but it is remarkable how in very distant areas of the world, in India and in Mexico, we are facing, well, with similar situations, no? where inequality, as uh, both you raise, is a big issue in, in, this, in this situation and it, it is part of the problem. So if we start solving inequality in our own context. Maybe it's also how we will improve the situation, but also it is society as a whole is not only women, of course. I mean, women obviously are more affected, but if we also tackle society as a whole, so men, children, elderly, whoever, I mean, we all be part of the solution as well, but also social traditions, I guess. I mean, because we are also very attained that maybe also women are only, I mean, left to do those tasks. So, so we are just forgetting them. And so they are responsible for collecting water. So that is also part of social tradition because we get used to it and that we have change, to change it. Political issues, governments, bad decisions, but also bad urban planning, isn't it? So, I mean, if we as well, urban planners or designers or only part of the society start to come up with different ideas on how to arrange space and I mean dwelling spaces and also where to get the water maybe it's, it's also part of, uh, of creating solutions. So I'll leave it to here and give the final words to, to Nawel. And thank you very much Araceli and thank you very much for your management of the of the answer of the question and the answer. And thank you very much um, again, uh, Valeria and Ishita. And thank you very much for your participation uh, and your question. Um, well, I want to say you this, um, this webinar is a recording and it will be soon available in our social media and also the presentation. And then you can see uh, soon in our social media. I would like in this last minute, in this last seconds, please, that everybody can turn on your video camera to see your faces, please, and to say, and maybe your microphone to say goodbye, please. Well, those who, whoever <laughs> they want, maybe not everybody wants, but. Goodbye. Well, <laughs> thank you very much. It was great. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Really inspiring. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. My thank video you so doesn't much. work. Yeah. Well Bye. 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 Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thanks, Ishita and Valeria. Thank you all for attending. Yeah. Valeria. <laughs> thank you for everybody to participate in the seminar and to be subscribed to it. And uh, we are also hoping to, I mean, to organize some other webinars, maybe with this same uh, subject, but maybe with, with other subjects. So hopefully we can, we can meet each other in the future. So thanks everybody Thank for, for being here.